Uh, if everyone would begin to uh, grab your seats, please feel free to grab a cup of coffee, a Danish, bring it to your table. I mean, this is, uh, I'm overwhelmed by the, uh, by the attendance here today. Um, and I know that our co-hosts are as well. So I, I, many of you have traveled from some distances. I think this is the most number of uh, outside of Washington, D.C. people we've ever had in one room at CSIS. So, um, uh, so we were, we were actually thrilled to have everyone here. And um, we're very thrilled, obviously, to have um, to Bart Johnson here. And I'll talk more about him in a second. But everyone, welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Rick Ozzie Nelson. And I'm a director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program here at the, at the center. Um, this event today is co-hosted, and it's kind of unique. We usually don't do events like this. Um, we usually get a sponsor, and it's usually one institution. But the topic of Fusion Center is, has been something that I've been wrestling with and, and our co-hosts have as well. And the three of us felt that it was important for us just to go out and be a little forward-leaning. Um, I can use that word, Washington, D.C., those words. Um, you know, forward-leaning on this. So our, you know, our co-host today, um, the Homeland Security um, and Studies and Analysis Institute, HSI, um, and then the Homeland Security and Engineering Development Institute, um, uh, from MITRE. Now, I have to explain how to get this right, so they'll, they'll excuse me if, this is, if I don't get this right, but HSI is the FFRDC, for one of the FFRDCs for DHS that focuses on studies and analysis, and SETI, for, uh, out of MITRE, is the one that focuses on systems engineering, FFRDC. CSIS, we're just one of these DC think tanks, so we bring the FFRDCs in to help us uh, pretend we're smart. But I want to go ahead and uh, thank our partners from HSI. Um, is, is Phil Anderson and Matt Phillips. Is Matt here? Did he, did he not make it? Where's Matt? Okay, Matt. And then from, uh, from SETI, um, Kim Warren, Ken Rapuano, Leslie Anderson, Barbara, Jeff Sands, I think are all over at this table here. So this is, even though I'm up here doing the talking and stealing the oxygen, um, these folks at the front tables here are the ones that put most of this behind, behind this. So, you know, uh, um, in, in recent years, a number of local governments uh, it, uh, with DHS have established a number of fusion centers, 72, correct? That's where we are. Um, with the idea of enhancing information and intelligence sharing um, within the jurisdictions and, and within departments and agencies of the federal government. Obviously, the things that we struggle with is the value proposition. What is the value proposition of these fusion centers for the federal government isn't always in line with the value proposition of these fusion centers are for the state and local governments. But I personally believe that these fusion centers are, are, have the potential to be critical assets across the state, local, and federal governments um, for, from a variety of factors. And some of the things we have to get to to make these fusion centers work and the issues we're going to explore today are what are those items. It's, a, it's nice to say that we need to share information, but we have some really difficult problems that, uh, that Bart's going to address here uh, and some of the panels are going to address. And it's getting to the time now where, again, a lot of folks are dealing with these issues, but to make them successful, especially in these budget tightening it tighten environments we need to start drilling down into what those issues are and how we can best move forward on doing that but to be we have three panels today um, each of the organizations is is responsible for one and we're going to kind of do the top-down approach I don't like that but that's just kind of how it planned out CSIS will be sponsoring the first panel the titles are in front of you and there we want to look at more of the strategic uh, vision of what the fusion centers are then HSI will lead one more on the policy and the integration level. And then lastly today, uh, it's probably the one that will get really into the nuts and bolts is going to be the SETI folks where they're going to lead a panel on technology. So when you're asking your questions, we try to get panelists that can focus on those themes, kind of keep your questions um, focused on those panels. So first question, when you talk about technology, let's, let's, let's leave that for the third panel. But enough of that. We're webcast today for uh, at least the first part of the event. I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, someone who's been here numerous times and for that I am personally grateful and I know that John Hamry is. Um, Bart Johnson, the Principal Deputy Undersecretary for Intelligence Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, Bart is going to do the keynote. Um, he's responsible for providing DHS as well as state, local, and tribal and private sector partners with information and intelligence related to Homeland Security. That title is probably one of the hardest jobs in the U.S. government. So um, um, prior to his appointment at INA in April 2009, Mr. Johnson served as the Director of Homeland Security and Law Enforcement at ODNI and the Office of Director of National Intelligence. 
In that capacity, he worked to facilitate communication between the intelligence community, probably the second most difficult job, and the federal, state, local, and tribal agencies, creating partner groups to allow these uh, individuals and these entities to directly integrate with DAI. But most importantly about um, uh, Mr. Johnson, and what's so critical to this is his background prior to, to coming to Washington, D.C., um, where he served as a colonel with the New York State Police and has more than 31 years of law enforcement experience, 20 of four of them with the New York State Police. And it's that background that is so critical to, to, to this Washington, D.C. environment to ensure that what happens at the federal government is value added to the state and local. Obviously, given the long, long, long experience in uh, Mr. Johnson's background information sharing, um, he's, you know, appropriately positioned to speak on this. So, uh, Bart, again, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, give a warm round of applause, and thank you once again for coming. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great, great to be here, and I want to really thank uh, Rick for that very kind uh, tee-up and uh, introduction. Uh, I concur with what Rick just said as it relates to the need for the National Network of Fusion Center, particularly as it relates to home and security. And what I'll try to do over the next 30 minutes or so is try to illustrate uh, some of the highlights, some of the progress uh, that has been made in partnership uh, with a lot of you out there. I would also like to echo uh, his thanks uh, to the organizers of this event. I'm not going to try to repeat them uh, for the sake of brevity, but I really appreciate it to really stand up this forum. Uh, a lot of friends uh, out in the audience, so I apologize for those of you who may have heard little pieces and nuggets of this, and for those of you that I don't know, uh, it's great to see you also, and, and I hope to share some of the experiences. The most important uh, thing to me um, is certainly um, the questions at the end, and, and I'll stay, you know, as long as I need to, you know, to answer the questions, and if not, you know, see me afterwards, and we'll certainly uh, try to get you the answers to any question that you may have. Um, as it relates to, you know, this, uh, this forum here today, I, I think it's very uh, timely uh, and very relevant uh, to really what's going on in the country uh, right now. Uh, there's a great assemblage of our state, local, and tribal uh, partners here, uh, some private sector folks, and all of us are members of the public. Um, it's interesting uh, that the department for the first time uh, developed the uh, Quizzer, it's affectionately known as the Quizzard. Uh, the Qu Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, and within it, uh, we defined the Homeland Security Enterprise. And I totally agree with that uh, uh, definition, in that includes uh, the federal government, uh, state, local, and tribal entities, uh, private entities, communities, and also the public. So all those pieces are very, very important in ensuring the safety and, and uh, prosperity uh, of our country. Uh, this session is also very timely in that the National Fusion Center Conference is coming up uh, in several weeks. So the discussions here are certainly going to uh, fold in very, very nicely to some of you who are actually going to be at that conference. So once again, I, I think it speaks well for the way that it was organized uh, by Rick and, and others, and also uh, the timeliness. So I thank you for that. Uh, some of the panels uh, are constructed very, very well. The, one of them is a discussion of the role of fusion centers in homeland security and also uh, counterterrorism. I think everybody knows quite well uh, the support and the, uh, the, the vocal nature of the secretary in support of this effort. And how do we build that capability? What does it mean uh, to us within the homeland and how do they play a role? Uh, the second one is uh, discussing the mutual benefits of the national network and how can the federal government uh, get the information that they need and the value added uh, to the proposition and how does state, local, and tribal law enforcement and homeless security officials get in return for that same value added and investment that they're making in, into it. And that is going to be a significant topic of discussion on Monday, the Monday before uh, the National Fusion Center Conference and some of you are also going to be uh, on that, there on that day. And then lastly, def defining priorities. Uh, we've come a long way. We know uh, where we've been. Uh, I'm going to let you know and update you as to where we are and a little bit about, you know, the future. But certainly we need to define the pr priorities as we move out and how we do that as a community to ensure that we maintain um, that, that value added that we all strive to do. I oftentimes reflect uh, in certain uh, parts of my career. Um, so over the past uh, several weeks, I've been reflecting because I've almost come up on two years now uh, being with the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, having started there on May 18th of 2009. 
Uh, oftentimes also I get a little impatient and I question about the progress uh, that has been made and are we doing it fast enough, are we applying ourselves, are we protecting the homeland so once we have the next attack we won't say, gee, we should have done this, we should have done that, or we could have done this, that we're striving and pushing every step of the way to do everything that we need to do uh, to protect the homeland. So I've been doing a little bit of that over the past you know, couple of weeks, and I'd like to share uh, some of those thoughts with you. And I would challenge each of you to ask yourself whether you're a private sector, uh, individual, state, local, or tribal, or federal government, are we really doing uh, all that we can? Um, obviously, you know, this all really started in earnest on September 11th, 2001. I believe each and every one of us uh, have a personal uh, story uh, to talk about, and everybody does remember where they were. Um, I always uh, make it a point uh, to mention two names, and those two names are uh, Sam Otis. Uh, he was a Peekskill police officer that I started with, and also P Paul Juergens, who I went through my basic training with back in 1977. Uh, Sammy later went with the fire department in New York City, and Paul Juergens was with the Port Authority, and they both lost their lives on September 11th of 2001. So really, since that day, this is really all I've been doing in partnership with a lot of you, and I go back and remember that as to why we've been doing, doing this with one another, and certainly what's been occurring, you know, over the past 21 months. The 9-11 uh, Commission report uh, very accurately uh, portrayed uh, some of the gaps, uh, some of the failures, and really that has been really the um, touchstone point for us, a foundational document to build upon as we try to evo evolve and enhance the environment. And once again, the events of you know, the past 21 months uh, speaks volumes as to where we are as it relates to the threat the evolution of the threat, and really working together the vigilance, the creativity, and the greater cooperation that we've all experienced over the past several years, and really to build upon and enhance that enterprise that I described to all of you earlier. And just for clarity, I just want to throw out some uh, statistics to you. Uh, there was recently a report uh, issued by the uh, New York State Intelligence Center. That's the one that I participated in and hopefully helped build a little bit, um, examining the last 32 major terrorism cases since 9-11. Uh, and what that report illustrated was that 50 of the 88 individuals involved in those plots were U.S. citizens at the time of their arrests, and the majority of them were born within the United States. And to highlight another report, the Congressional Research uh, Service report um, made some striking comparisons that between May of 2009 and November of uh, 2010, there were 22 uh, homegrown plots uh, that were carried out by American citizens or legal per permanent residents. By comparison, uh, the seven years after September 11th, there were a total of 21 uh, terrorist plots. So that apparent uh, spike, that obvious spike, is something that we need to uh, be very, very concerned uh, about. And when you also look at two various ser very serious plots in the name of David Headley and Najibul Azazi, uh, we had uh, two successful terrorist attacks in the name of Carlos Bledsoe and N Nadal Hassan, and we had three near misses, uh, one on uh, December 25th with Umar Farouk Abdul Matalib, uh, May 1st uh, with Faisal Shahzad, and then most recently on October 29th with the failed cargo plot. So we've missed a few, interrupted a few, and that pace and that persistence, you know, certainly uh, uh, continues. So what does that illustrate to me? What that says to me is that we can't rely on the intelligence community and all the fine work that they do each and every day in foreign fields and in intercepts and their capabilities. We can't rely on them all the time. We need to enable, empower, and train and make the officers and our homeless security officials and the public more aware of what the threat is. And I believe the Attorney General and the Secretary, both in congressional hearings and also public statements, you know, have been doing uh, exact, exactly that. So there's been some talk about, you know, over the past 21 months, uh, is this an anomaly, uh, what is occurring, or it, is it the new norm? Uh, for me, it's the new norm. I believe we have to operate under the premise that there's other individuals here operating within the homeland who can attack with little or no warning. So that, once again, brings into clarity the importance of state, local, and tribal. 
And when you look back at some of the uh, opportunities, you know, that law enforcement uh, always capitalizes upon, I'd like to mention two of them. And that was uh, Trooper Charlie Batch, who was out on routine patrol and stopped a car uh, for no front plate. And it turned out to be Tim McVeigh. And that was because of that individual doing, doing his job. And also uh, Trooper Catalano on September 9th of 2001, when he stopped Ziad Jarrah. Uh, before he flew the plane into, into the fields of Pennsylvania. So those interactions are occurring each and every day in law enforcement, so we need to make sure that they get the information uh, that they need. So once again, um, the passing of that information is critical, and that's what you know, we're striving to do, and I think we're making you know, some very uh, significant strides. Um, I want to coin a phrase also and borrow it from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, you know, that homeland security begins with hometown security. I was very fortunate to have spent six years working in the city of Peekskill as a young patrol officer, and it's amazing what you see out on patrol, uh, the interactions with the public, uh, walking a beat, driving a patrol car, making vehicle and traffic, traffic stops, and the op opportunities to observe suspicious activity and really act upon it and get it into the hands of the right people. And that's really what this is uh, all about. Uh, so obviously, um, the department and the se secretary has invested a lot of time and effort into building uh, this national uh, network of fusion centers. And I'd like to uh, point out uh, she gave a presentation a couple uh, uh, weeks ago at George Washington University, and it was titled uh, The State of Americans' Homeland Security, and it was an, an address, and I encourage you uh, to pull it up and read it because it says a lot about what we're doing and the interrelationships of the intelligence community, the federal government, the fusion centers, uh, the nationwide suspicious activity reporting initiative, and then see something, say something, and how they're all supportive of one another and intertwined with one another. And it's all to enable uh, the FBI's led joint terrorism task forces. Uh, the JTTS do an absolutely phenomenal job, and what I didn't mention were many of the fine investigations that they've done over the past 21 months and they are supported and enabled by the fusion centers and the information that they have access to that are then provided to the JTTS. And there's been a number of successes uh, in that regard. So moving forward, uh, from a federal perspective, we need to define uh, what the federal government is getting out of this relationship. And quite frankly, um, we're getting a lot out of it, and we haven't even begun to realize the full potential uh, and magnitude of what we, we can get out of this relationship. And I mentioned it to you a little bit about what is Lieutenant Tom Monahan getting at it, this relationship with the Fusion Center, and how he is keeping uh, Sheriff Gillespie uh, satisfied that the Fusion Center is providing the value added to address and mitigate uh, in an all-crimes fashion things like narcotics, uh, uh, money laundering, uh, firearms trafficking, and also human smuggling. So there has to be that value added and that balance particularly, as uh, uh, Ozzy mentioned, the declining budgets uh, that, that uh, we're witnessing out there right now. So you may ask uh, me, and rightfully so, uh, what are we doing about it? And I believe we're doing quite a bit uh, in partnership uh, with one another. Um, just about coming up on a year ago uh, at the National Fusion Center Conference, uh, we took this document called uh, the Baseline Capabilities. Uh, the Baseline Capabilities came out in 2008 and that was built by the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council uh, in partnership with the federal government uh, as it relates to the fusion centers, the 72 of them. And we wanted to make sure that they were built upon a strong foundation so as they grew and mature, they would have a series of commonalities associated with them. And that was the importance of that, that founding document. So at the national conference, we highlighted some of those critical operational capabilities to be defined as the ability to receive, uh, analyze, uh, disseminate, and gather information. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there's a lot of great information in the intelligence com community that is criminally related that the fusion centers need to keep themselves aware of the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and indicators, and warnings that could be a tipper to potential uh, terrorist planning, plotting and how to mitigate it. So we need to make sure that we, they have the ability, they, the fusion centers, have the ability to receive that information, both in classified and unclassified channels, and to be trained to know what to do with that. Uh, complementary to that um, are, cl are clearances. 
Uh, the President recently signed an executive order uh, putting uh, the Secretary uh, as the executive agent uh, to, for the issuance of the clearances. There was just an article yesterday about how that has improved and it continues to improve to make sure that state, local, and tribal and private sector have the appropriate clearances. Um, additionally, once you receive it, there needs to be uh, an analytical level of experience within the fusion center to know what to do with it. Um, in other words, to overlay it to the threat, to overlay it against the vulnerabilities and try to realize what that vulnerability or threat is in your, your area of responsibility, the fusion centers. And once they get that information, it needs to be provided to uh, the, the partners. And the partners are law enforcement, uh, the pr private sector, uh, Homeland Security officials, and certainly something that has evolved over the years are the uh, field intelligence officers. Uh, so, for example, in New York State, uh, every police agency in the state had a field intelligence officer to act as a liaison and that connect back to the fusion center to make sure that they get the information that they need and provide a very viable uh, dialogue uh, back and forth. Uh, so that, once again, is maturing. Uh, I mentioned gathering. Uh, in, a young trooper out on patrol, uh, makes observation based on those indicators and warnings. They need a process, the Nationwide Suspicious Activity Reporting Initiative, to record and document that information and get it back into the system, the Fusion Center, into shared space to be shared with the Fusion Center, the federal government, and certainly the Joint Terrorism Task Forces for p potential investigation. Um, and once again, see something, say something. I mentioned the Homeland Security Enterprise and the importance of the public. I think you remember on May 1st, uh, there was a vendor, uh, Times Square, observed uh, uh, some smoke. Uh, so he saw something and he said something to a mounted patrol officer that possibly mitigated it pre and prevented a much more uh, serious uh, consequence from that observation. So they're all interrelated uh, with one another. And certainly, um, we, law enforcement, or in my prior life law enforcement, you have no better advocate than you do in a law enforcement officer as it relates to privacy, civil liberties, and civil rights. That's what they're trained to, that's what they're held accountable to, uh, and they know what reasonable su suspicion is, they know what probable cause is, and they know that they have to raise their hand, put their hand on a Bible, and prove beyond a reasonable doubt for a conviction of an individual. So they take it very, very seriously. But having said that, we've made a lot of progress also with the privacy policies with the fusion centers. I believe in the early part of 2010, we were at about five or six fully executed privacy policies. We're now at a 56, and there's another uh, eight or so in the pipeline. So we're tracking very well that by the, by the time the Fusion Center Conference is upon us next month, uh, we'll have virtually every uh, Fusion Center with a, a, a proven uh, a policy uh, in place. Also, as it relates to achieving and sustaining these critical uh, operational capabilities in, is important, and I'll speak to that uh, in a moment. So what is this doing uh, for us, the application of the critical operational capabilities, the maturing of the network? Uh, what it's doing is, is, is providing some successes. So we've seen successes. Those uh, uh, successes are increasing exponentially, and I'd like to uh, share some of those with you. Uh, some fusion centers have actually provided information that has found its way into the presidential da daily brief. So the president is briefed every day on the threat and information, and some of that information ha has, has uh, reached his desk. Also regarding the uh, fusion center uh, liaison officer program that, that I mentioned, uh, see something, say something, uh, law enforcement in the fusion centers played a critical role uh, during Najibul Azazi and also Faisal Shahzad, and Florida actually provided some information that found its way into the National Counterterrorism Center through the JTTFs that once again added value and clarity uh, to uh, the investigation. And certainly just think about also the capabilities and the tripwires and, and the eyes and ears that are out there regarding uh, reasonable suspicion and su suspicion of potential plotting and planning of uh, terrorist activities. So already a lot of progress is being made, a lot of success is being made, and that's really just uh, scratching the surface. Obviously, you know, when we develop these, these relationships, we continue to work uh, with the intelligence community. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention uh, Russ Porter. Uh, Russ Porter is the Director of Homeland Security and Law Enforcement uh, for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Have a great relationship with Russ. Uh, he's a former uh, I Iowa State Police Officer. 
Um, so he's leveraging the intelligence community, working very closely with us to ensure that that process also matures as we continue to move forward. Uh, what we're doing also is, is looking to help enable this national network, continue to sustain the effort, uh, certainly provide a value and deploy the resor resources and assets that we need to do on a regular basis. So I'd like to speak, you know, for a moment about some of the uh, field support uh, that we provided, uh, certainly su the support what we're doing internally with the department regarding the nationwide suspicious activity reporting initiative, and also I spoke earlier about the critical operational capabilities, where we're going with that, and also a little bit about analysis. Um, regarding the field support, I believe we made a lot of success. Uh, we're up to about uh, 70 uh, forward deployed uh, personnel to the field. Uh, we have the uh, country broken up into regions, considering it's growing, and we m need uh, more uh, regional directors out there. So the footprint is virtually in every fusion center right now. So that's a good news story. Um, also, we are continue to enhance our capabilities as it relates to connectivity. Uh, we now have 51 centers connected to classified systems, along with, of course, LEO, RIS, and uh, HISN, uh, the Homeland Security Information Network. Uh, we're providing a significant amount of training uh, regarding privacy, civil liberties, civil rights. Uh, the um, uh, anal analyt, you know, I spoke about uh, centers of analytic e excellence. We're trying to build that capability uh, with the federal government and the fusion centers. Uh, we certainly have a very uh, successful technical assist assistance program where we, along with the federal government and some of our partners with the fusion centers, go out to the fusion centers to build those capabilities as it relates to analysis and connectivity and clearances and the like to make sure that they're all at a level, level platform. And additionally, we're working very closely with community-oriented policing staff, the COPS office, and also the Bureau of Justice Assistance as it relates to grant funding. You'll notice uh, in this past year, um, 2010, the language was strengthened, and we're pretty optimistic that we're going to continue to strengthen that language to ensure that the money that's being applied is applied to mitigating the critical operational gaps that have been identified. Um, regarding the NSI, I mentioned before what we're doing within the department. Uh, about uh, a year ago, uh, the Office of Intelligence and Analysis took over that initiative uh, for the SAR, SAR program. So under the leadership of uh, Dave Sobchak, a former uh, Chicago police officer who now works with INA, uh, he's leading an effort within the department to make sure that we have the capabilities to receive uh, suspicious activity, that we have the capability of connect to connect, that they are all properly trained and aware of what the indicators and warnings are, and that furthermore we have that analysis partnership uh, here at the department to be able to build that capability to analyze this information as it's coming across uh, the systems and then provide reports, which we're starting to do as more and more information is finding its way into the shared space. So I think we're making uh, great progress in that regard. Uh, regarding mitigating the uh, capability uh, gaps, the critical operational capabilities, uh, for the first time last summer, uh, we actually visited every fusion center in the country. Uh, in partnership with the Fusion Center directors, the FBI, and certainly DHS to measure each of those critical operational capabilities. So right now, we know where every Fusion Center stands. We know if they're ad hoc or if they're defined or if they're institutionalized throughout the country. And what we did in the fall, September, October, November, and into December, we've developed a short-term mitigation plan that we worked very closely with the program manager's office uh, for the information sharing environment to start filling those gaps and building those capabilities. So once again, working very closely with the directors, um, we're well on our way to do, doing that. And right now I'm waiting for the results of a survey that was sent out to see what successes we had in meeting and filling some of those gaps. And working with my staff and, and also the FBI, uh, we're building a long-term strategy to ensure that it's sustained along with uh, performance management, along with exercises. So when somebody says, yes, we filled the gap, we'll be able to exercise it to make certain that they did indeed fill that gap. And once again, I mentioned the grant funding to assist them, the fusion centers, in filling the gaps. So you see it's all interrelated and supportive of one another. I mentioned a little bit about analysis. Uh, once again, the, the partnership uh, with the Bureau is phenomenal. 
Um, Tony Placido, who's now retired, we built a great relationship with him, with the DEA, about the analysis to make sure that our production plans are aligned with one another, that we're providing value and timeliness and relevancy to provide operational and actionable information to the front lines in the field and that they get that information uh, as fast as they can. So I believe we made a lot of progress, developed a number of new products, uh, one of which was uh, developed at, at the, um, in partnership with the ITAG-G, the Interagency Threat Assessment Coordination Group, uh, called the Snapshot. And really what the Snapshot is, is, it's a document, it's about five pages long, it's in a PowerPoint format that comes out within 12 hours of an incident, and they've come out after Faisal Shahzad, uh, the Moscow bombing, and others, so they can get situational awareness and provide value to their partners as it relates to what happened, where, when, how it was executed, what were the tactics, techniques, who may be responsible, and maybe some preventative measures that be, could be taken if it reveals itself within the homeland. Uh, so once again, I believe some progress has been made uh, in that regard also. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't uh, mention some of the partnerships that, that we have. Uh, I'm very fortunate that the partnerships that I still do have uh, with all of the major law enforcement and homeland security uh, agencies. Um, I could pick up the phone anytime, anywhere, and have a dialogue with them, and it's great to see the support that they provide on a daily basis. I want to call out one in particular because they, they, they do have on their uh, committee uh, every major law enforcement and homeland security organization, and that's the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council. And that's led by Ron Brooks of San Francisco and Mike McClary of the Las Vegas PD. Uh, they're true partners, they're forward-leaning, they're action-orientated, and they're really committed to this effort in partnership with the federal government. And for that, I'm truly thankful. Um, what I'd like to do is close with really where I began. And once again, you know, challenge myself and my team, which I do every day, are we doing enough, are we leaning forward enough, are we partnering enough and being transparent enough with our partners so they know what we're doing. So once again, Ozzy, I really appreciate this forum to provide an opportunity to illustrate to each of you what we're doing on a regular basis. And I would challenge you also, you know, whether you're private sector or you're meeting the requirements of the systems that are being made, you know, state, local, and tribal, do you believe that you're doing enough each and every day? And certainly our partners uh, within the federal government. Because the bottom line to all this is, is a, a young state trooper, uh, which I was at one point in time, and for that I'm thankful, is out on patrol and um, writing tickets, which I was very good at and they're very good at. Um, so you picture a young state trooper on I-95 just outside of New York City, which connects Connecticut to New York City, and he stops a car for doing, I don't know, 80 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, pulls that individual over, makes sure the car is you know, safely placed on the side of the road, puts that Stetson on, the purple tie, approaches the car, license registration, insurance card, uh, you're stopped for speeding, and they're very observant troopers. Uh, so they start looking around the car, they may see a, a drawing on the front seat, may see a, a timer in the back, you know, in the glove box when they retrieve uh, license registration, may see a propane tank and some wires, and all those things individually possessed are not illegal. And even, you know, in the car, they're not illegal, but put together, you would have something that could have happened on May 1st in Times Square with Faisal Shahzad. So that's really what this is all about. Uh, this is Plan A, there is no Plan B, and there shouldn't be a Plan B. This is a national network of fusion cent centers and something that I believe you know, needs to be enhanced, needs to continue to provide the value added, and it's certainly institutionalized. Uh, so I know I've said a lot, but I hope I've given you a sense as to where we were. Uh, where we are and certainly where we need to be in the future. And I really look forward to hearing um, the uh, back briefs on the panels uh, that, gonna, that are going to follow me. And I've looked at the list, you know, the individuals who are uh, on the panels. I'm not going to mention them by name, um, but there's some people on those panels who have played a critical role uh, and others in this room who built the foundation for me to build upon over the past uh, two years. So I just really want to thank you all for your attention. And Ozzy, I'll be more than happy to take any questions anybody has.
Great. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. We appreciate that. And again, we love having you over here because your remarks are always uh, so substantive and the detail you provided about what DHS and, and your office is specifically doing uh, is refreshing because there's usually a lot of big hand waves in this town that we want to, again, do information sharing, but drilling down and showing exactly what you're doing is, 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 is just you know, incredibly worthwhile to the dialogue. So with that said, um, questions and answers, I think most of you know the CSIS. We have microphones around the room. When you get the microphone, please state your name and your affiliation if you have one, and questions only, no statements. Um, and then we'll let uh, Mr. Johnson go address them. So the first one right here, and you have a really big name tag, Mitzi. So the microphone's right behind you. Thank you. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. I'm a social anthropologist by training, so I come to this from looking at how people behave. What you're describing to me sounds like a major cultural change in behavior, because when I came to town, if you were in the intelligence community, if you had information, you held on to it because information was powerful. How, how do you build this trusted network? How does the woman in Arizona who noticed that this fellow was taking pilot training. How, how would you pick that up today? And is, are there any changes in the personnel systems that reward people for sharing? It's a great question. Um, over the past three years, I've, I've, I thought I knew a little bit about the intelligence community. I didn't know nearly enough about it. I really admire what they do and really how they share that information because they have that trust in the systems and the accountability and the clearances to be able to share it safely. And what you mentioned, um, I was guilty of that. Um, I ran the narco units for New York State and that information was a close hold and nobody would ever see it. And it probably impacted on other opportunities to solve a complete organization as it relates to narcotics uh, smuggling. But having said that, uh, I think there's been a lot of lessons learned regarding countering terrorism. Nobody wants to sit on any information at all that could be related to preventing a terrorist attack. So I'm pretty confident that that, that progress and that passage of that information from a young woman making out an observation and meeting the uh, functional standard, finding its way to the fusion center, is getting to the JTTFs. And I think additionally, a lot of lessons learned are being had, and it's also breaking down some barriers regarding narcotics and weapons to get that information out also in a timely manner so law enforcement as a whole can benefit from it. Um, regarding accountability, um, within uh, uh, the troopers, um, we actually called it out um, as an accountable thing uh, in their performance appraisal, that if you weren't cooperative in sharing, you wouldn't be rated as high. And that's also true within the intelligence community. So it is finding its way into the training, the accountability, and some of it is generational, but it's all about leadership too, and setting the standard and holding people accountable to those standards. Don, go ahead. Microphone's right to your left. I'm Lauren. The, uh, and thank you for your remarks, Bart, and thank you for the service to the nation that you've provided for these years. To follow Mitzi's question and, and draw that out a little bit, while we've made marked improvement since 9-11, uh, and certainly in very recent times, in sharing of information and intelligence, uh, what would you consider, and that in part is due to a lot of your efforts, what would you consider the three largest remaining challenges to the sharing of Homeland Security intelligence and information that we should put on the burner, front burner, and look at solving? Okay. Um, I, I think one of the things to prevent is complacency, um, to ensure that um, we communicate very, very effectively to Homeland Security and law enforcement personnel and the public. Um, it's where I started the conversation regarding operating under the premise that they're still here, attack with little or no warning, and continue to illustrate that, that will enable sharing. So that's something that we need to stay sharp to. Um, I think also the budgets um, are very, very critical right now. Um, it's, it's creating a lot of opportunities, quite frankly, to maybe collapse some of these information sharing systems and really provide a uh, very value added um, as it relates to uh, overcoming some of those obstacles. I think also we need to uh, continue to build the trust in the relationship. I still don't believe um, state, local, and tribal capabilities, assets, and expertise are truly understood uh, within the intelligence community and other pockets out there. 
not through any nefarious reasons, but just because lack of awareness. And just funny mention it, I, I spoke to uh, David Shedd yesterday, the Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, about coming over to see him in three weeks and his leadership team, his Homeland team, to start having that conversation because David is a true believer and leader in this regard when I worked with him at the o ODNI. Okay, so. hey, that's, uh, let's go over here in the front. Microphone's coming from behind you there. We'll get the red tie next. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, closer. Uh, Samira Daniels of Ramsey Decisions. Um, I've had the benefit of being um, in the national security law community <laughs> for the past five years. And um, the thing that I uh, am a little bit surprised about, you know, there, there's a kind of a magical sense of information sharing. And uh, I'm just wondering, um, and the, the reason I say this is because information sharing, uh, I mean, that's, I think what people are pretty good at. <laughs> they gossip, they, you know, and, and it, and, you know, they're bad habits of mind that have developed, and I just wonder if in uh, the process of information sharing, whether you have outside, um, you know, input, you know, it's an, it's, that is really, you know, goes to the heart of critical thinking, which I have seen in the uh, evidence, you know, case building is, it's a, still a weak, it's rather than strong um, part of, uh, you know, enforcement. That's just my opinion. Just, just to comment to that, um, there's a lot of information sharing going on. Uh, my in-basket, probably right now when I go back on my BlackBerry, about 50 messages of that information sharing. But what's needed more is a little bit more focus and, and requirements. Why are we sharing, with whom we're sharing, and really what the value is of sharing that little piece of in information to enable law enforcement to act upon it. And, and I think that's something that we need to address and focus on. Uh, because a lot of the young, a young analysts, they have to access maybe about 50 different systems with 50 different passwords uh, to pull it all together. And, and I believe through technology and requirements, maybe we can neck that down a little bit for them to focus on really what matters. Okay, the gentleman over here in front, the burgundy tie. Bart, I have uh, two questions. I'm Rob Regal uh, with Missions Concepts, but I also was the former director of the State and Local Fusion Center program. Um, Number one, are the results of the baseline capabilities review from last spring going to be made publicly available? Uh, that'd be number one. And then number two, what do you think the effect of the WikiLeaks is going to be on information sharing as far as is there a potential chilling effect? Because we've already seen this week a member of Congress that, uh, you know, sort of poo-pooed the whole idea about need to share. So I'd like to get your thoughts on both of those items. If I could. Sure. Um, Rob Regal was part of that foundation that I was talking to that I've been able to build upon, so thank you for that, Rob. Um, regarding um, the uh, critical operational capabilities, yes, we have a, uh, a document that is releasable, and, you know, I just point you to Joel Cohen, you know, get your hands on that. It's not a problem at all. Uh, secondly, it's a great question. I had the same concern with WikiLeaks, and it's, you know, the entire information sharing environment shouldn't be um, penalized on the activity of the nefarious activities of a young man overseas. Um, so could it have a chilling effect? Could people use it as an excuse not to share? Yes, certainly they can. Uh, but the good news is, is that we're fully engaged in that process. The Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council is aware of it. Um, Russ Travers uh, is actually working now at the White House uh, from the National Counterterrorism Center, and he has the right mindset to this that it can't and shouldn't diminish the information sharing to keep information from the people who could have it. But having said that, we need to improve the training, the accountability, and also the systems that are carrying that very, very important information. Okay, next question. A gentleman over here, Rob. Bob Crouch, um, Miter Seti. Uh, Bart, um, what is your vision for incorporating the private sector, private sector CIKR uh, in the future infusion centers? We're, we're, we're doing a pretty good job at that with the federal government. Um, 
but we need to do a better job uh, in that regard. So my vision is to enable the fusion centers, and I'm pretty confident that they know uh, what the critical infrastructure and key resources are in their area of responsibility. Um, so I don't want to do it from the uh, inside the beltway. I don't want to be responsible for sending that information out to CIKR. I want to empower and enable the fusion centers to be doing that. And that's, you know, that's based on their knowledge, their expertise, and it gives value added to them also because they know better than just about anybody what the vulnerabilities are sitting right there with them. Um, I believe Dawn Scalisi, she's the Deputy Undersecretary, um, has done a, an excellent job in the products that are created for the Secretary and the leadership are now being shared with the components and they're now being shared with the fusion centers and now they're even being shared with private sector. So we're doing a lot better uh, in that regard and we're pretty optimistic on the way forward. Uh, any, other, any other questions? You, you know, Bart, I, I have a question that one I get a lot and um, I think it's, it'd be great coming from you is a lot of folks when they talk about the function of the fusion center, the, 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 the JTTFs come up. How do they work with the JTF, JTTFs? And some folks that are not supportive of the fusion centers are actually uh, use that as a, as, a, as a critical stick. And I don't think, based on your comments and also what I've heard, that's true. I believe there's actually good coordination. Can you, can you describe that or expound upon that? Yeah, sure. Um, the fusion centers, particularly in New York State, um, are really value-added uh, with the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. I had the opportunity to work with uh, Pete Ahern, uh, John Pikus, Joe Billy, uh, some of the brightest minds within the FBI uh, regarding that relationship. And the New York State Intelligence Center um, had um, a great understanding what they were to do. And what they were to do were to be those eyes and ears, the front lines, the information shares, the awareness for the front lines, the interaction with the field intelligence officers to get that information to the system. And sitting at the NYSIC was an FBI agent. Um, so they had full scope and awareness of everything that's coming in. Uh, the JTTS uh, also had the right of first refusal. So if a tip came in, they would look at it and say, hey, you know, we're going to take this one. This looks like something. Or, hey, Colonel Johnson, can you keep this one, run it a little bit, see where it goes, and then we would go back to them and say, hey, you do want to take this one, and then they would take it. So, and the JTTS are investigative, and yes, some intelligence through the FIGs, uh, but but the, the, the NYSIX and the fusion centers of the world are intelligence. They are not investigative, and they are not to be doing investigations instead of the uh, JTTFs. So to me, it's very clear. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions, gentlemen, in the white shirt right here? Thank you. Uh, Tip Clifton, Eastport Analytics. Um, you mentioned uh, the issue of information overload and about how one of the answers is to focus on the requirements to hopefully choke down the information. Um, and information overload isn't just happening here or at the fusion center, it's happening all the way out past the fusion centers out in the hometown arena. What can we be doing at the federal level to help out in the fusion centers and out beyond the fusion centers into the hometown arena to help folks with that flood of information in this context? C can you define ho hometown arena for you? You mean like I, the I general mean past, public? Past the fusion centers out into the state and the local, the, the, uh, the communities those fusion centers are supporting. Okay, all right. Um, once again, I go back to the information needs and requirements. What is going to help uh, a young state trooper do their job better? Um, and to me, to do their job better, it's really about the indicators and warnings of terrorist activity, um, what uh, the new type of drugs are that are out there. When, when I was in the city of Peekskill, there was something that came on the scene called crack. And um, that crack revealed itself during the early 80s. And I actually stopped the car and saw stuff, and I didn't know what that stuff was until my partner says, hey, Bart, that's crack. Um, so how do you get that type of information out to have a better informed uh, law enforcement officer, uh, a better aware, and the wherewithal to who do you report it to, and once you report it, the confidence that something's going to be done with that information. So it's all about requirements, and not to speak for local law enforcement, but my relationships with local law enforcement, yes, they do have the same problem. And the same solutions that apply between the federal government and the fusion centers are now going to cascade down to help assist in that regard also. Great. Any other questions out there in the audience? Going once, going twice. Well, Bart, once again, it's always an honor and a privilege to have you here. Uh, we appreciate your substantive remarks, and, um, and uh, we'll hopefully we'll do some good work for you guys today, and uh, you can get some good feedback. So a round of applause for Mr. Johnson. Thank you.